Anger by Alexander Augustus Narrated by Daniel Collard Volume 1, Chapter 1 In the year 2040, I unwittingly forced Queen Elizabeth II to witness my suicide. She could not scream in protest, nor cry, nor even sob quietly. By that time she had no eyes to moisten or mouth to call out with. Her body was composed of a thin slip of plastic paper, fluttering in an icy draught on the windowsill of my London flat. She was anchored by some scattered coins, pinned under the discs which bore her former face in two dimensions staring down with anxious, unblinking eyes as she comprehended my cold, unblinking eyes. Fuck you, Boris, I muttered as water beat down on the exposed flesh within which I was held captive. The body which contained me lost consciousness. Unbeknownst to me, Elizabeth would become my saviour of sorts, and I would be reborn, more powerful than anyone could have imagined. The events I am about to describe have not yet come to pass. Our story begins in the boiling, toxic, tangerine summer of 2030. Climate change, disease and the breakdown of social structures have pushed humanity to the fringes of what we might call normality. The wealthy elite secret themselves away in isolation, aided by their machines, as the mass of key workers toil under increasingly oppressive restrictions to keep society functioning. A new pattern of thought has begun to emerge, appealing to the upper and lower classes alike. If our climate is a variable we cannot fix, perhaps our bodies could be adapted instead. Following a massive ischemic stroke to her left temporal lobe, Queen Elizabeth II was rushed to Shell Corp Laboratories in a private ambulance. Sirens blared as she faded in and out of consciousness. She was 104 years old and wielded the authority of the longest serving monarch in world history. Her last wish was quite clear. She was to enter the Shell program. Her mind would be extracted from her failing body and she would be transformed into a higher form of being with a new body, freer than anything she had yet experienced. Free of the pain, the hazmat suit, free of the hovering, jet-propelled, diamond-encrusted throne mobile which paraded her through the streets like a waving mascot for the masses. Now she glided through the hallways of the facility as she lay on a stretcher, stiff like a fallen tree approaching a waterfall. Subterranean doors slapped open and hissed shut behind the train of doctors, nurses, engineers and technicians. They flapped around the Queen like moths jostling for position on a light bulb, and in charge of them all, was the celebrated neuroscientist, Dr. Leopold Buttercake. Fix the IV, stat! Where's Mary? Get Mary in, now! Dr. Buttercake was a Yorkshireman who was short, stout, and curiously moist, like a teapot which continually tipped over and leaked on itself. He had first met the Queen when she toured the old Shell Labs facility and had agreed then to personally guide her body through the extraction process. The world would have to be told what had happened to her, but not yet, not until the procedure had been completed successfully. Elizabeth understood that many things could go wrong with the technology still in its infancy. Very little information about the Shell program had been leaked to the public, and certainly not Elizabeth's wish to be one of the earliest high-profile patients. For now, the news media only knew that the Queen had had a stroke. Known for her exceptionally responsible and outwardly serious nature, Elizabeth Windsor had long accepted that her body was an instrument of the state, never fully her own to command, always duty-bound to others. Because of this, she struggled with human relationships. She hated being scrutinised by those who pried into her private affairs, and she avoided press interviews like the plague. She preferred the company of her beloved animals, the dogs and horses who made no judgement on her character, family or office. On her 1999 trip to Seoul, 
Elizabeth had heard a curious Korean folk tale about an elderly woman who escaped her social obligations and decrepit body by transforming into a puppy. The story quite took her fancy, and courtiers would often find Elizabeth gazing into the distance, expecting that she was contemplating some official business, when in fact she was miles away, fantasizing about life as a corgi. Such joy, she thought. But unlike puppies, royal humans were expected to show decorum. Elizabeth was well suited to diplomatic office, being orderly, polite and restrained in all her dealings. When they were children, Elizabeth's sister Margaret made no secret of her yearning for adventure. Both girls were educated privately in their Mayfair home by a succession of governesses, and so shielded from the exciting and dangerous things one might confront on the streets. Slumped over her 18th century chestnut desk during French classes, Margaret dreamed of running free. Indeed she would, later behaving with such debauchery in Hollywood that British diplomats would ban her from future visits to the US. But Elizabeth was in no position to enjoy cocaine fueled romps with movie stars. She remained fundamentally sensible and well-behaved, even if, secretly, she was envious of her younger sister's displays of wild rebellion. Then a shock. In 1952, Elizabeth's father died, and the following year she acceded to the throne. She was never supposed to be queen. She was only 25. Her life became infinitely more constrained, with Parliament, the media, and the demands of international politics closing in. Elizabeth's silk-gloved hands would never again be permitted to brush against normal things like the grab pole in the London Underground, or the kitchen knife which chopped the food she ate, or the steering wheel of a car. It was not her expectation to be locked away in posh castles, and later put on display in the flying vestibule which was her throne mobile. As the years passed, Elizabeth grew to find escapism in gritty soap operas on TV, imagining she might have lived her own life with such drama. It was surreal to her that the tarty young woman on the market stalls had cash registers filled with money displaying Elizabeth's own face. She wished she could open her two-dimensional eyes on these notes and watch herself being passed from the pub to the bookies and from home to home. She imagined being on the set of EastEnders, experiencing the raw drama of the working classes the freedom of anonymity, to select some high heels and a wig from the racks and vanish, to truly be amongst her people and see her value firsthand. But alas, one cannot haggle with people who know you are post-economic, a term which made Elizabeth feel numb to the excitement of the world. In the year 2020, the world changed forever. Elizabeth watched as the coronavirus swept over every corner of the globe. It was highly infectious and deadly to the vulnerable making human contact precarious. This was the first wave of disease, with over 15 million infected. Following this, successive waves sparked up and spread like wildfire, each one seemingly with its own target group. Everyone was at risk. Social distancing measures were enacted and sanctions were placed on those who violated them. Elizabeth found herself in more extreme isolation than she was used to, separated even from her family. Groups of essential workers, named key workers, had been hit hard by the initial wave of the disease, but were not so affected by later waves. Those who had received more exposure in 2020 developed a certain level of immunity. Shop workers, builders, drivers, the police and military, and of course medical frontliners and carers. While the home office workers and post-economic dilettantes allowed their muscles to wither, everyone else kept going. Elizabeth continued to watch the bawdy slappers on daytime TV haggling for the best price of a pound of meat or set of cheap hair extensions, but she did so behind glass. Floating along in her throne mobile, Elizabeth continued to wave to the crowds of gaunt and balding men and women. Propelled through the streets in her air-conditioned cage, she often felt hopeless. She issued pronouncements through the speakerphone. We are trying to do all we can to help our gallant key workers, and we are trying to, to bear our share of the danger and sadness of these times. But in private, her thoughts were quite different. We are failing to adapt. How can it be that one's mind is as vast as a universe, infinitely creative, ingenious and advanced, yet one's body remains so vulnerable, like a wonderful pearl trapped inside an old shell? And Elizabeth was not the only leader to have such thoughts. There was a growing sentiment that the maintenance of the human body was far too costly to the environment and to each other. 
requiring intense food production to nourish these frail vessels, houses to contain them, machines to transport them, armies to destroy them. Locked behind closed doors and pinging back and forth on encrypted lines, the rich and ingenious homebound gradually conceived the Shell Programme. This experimental initiative was to offer the elite of British society an opportunity to evacuate their human bodies, and although it was never made publicly known what Shell Corp was for, or who was directing it at all, many companies across the UK had a hand in developing pieces of the technology involved. There were a lot of donations from undeclared sources, and a lot of secret government funding had been directed towards setting up labs and sourcing a team of scientists and technical staff. In 2030, Her Majesty requested an audience with the public face of the programme, Dr Leopold Buttercake. She was invited to the Shell Corp lab site in East Anglia. Telly who! clapped Elizabeth as a throwmobile powered up the final access road towards the laboratory buildings with reliable speed. The vehicle delivered her to the gates of Shell Labs, while hazmat-suited courtiers hurried behind with rolls of red carpet under their arms. The hazmat suits of the early 2030s were not like the bulky orange things you would see on television at nuclear spill sites in earlier decades. The material of the outfits rested tighter against the skin, available in a range of fashion-conscious designs. They could be worn discreetly under coats and slipped inside ordinary shoes, although these were always hung in cupboards outside the home, never brought inside for fear of contamination. Leopold Buttercake wore a lab coat over the top of his hazmat suit, a bright yellow name badge prominent on his chest. He was weak-kneed with anticipation as he opened the gate to the Queen. Your Majesty, this is the highest honour. Please follow me. He trotted alongside Elizabeth's hovering throne-mobile, occasionally daring to place a hand on a ruby-encrusted knob to prop himself up. His thick Yorkshire burr was often mistaken for a casual approach. Hey up, lads, we'd best get to ball rolling if we want to survive to apocalypse, he might say as he rallied his troops. But rivals soon learned not to underestimate him, as his pragmatic intensity led him to explore solutions no one else would dare to. He led the way with the jittery nervousness you might expect of someone explaining to their queen how her subjects would be engineered into a new species. I have the great fortune of fronting, he paused to wipe his brow, a world-renowned team, ma'am. In a sweeping conference room overlooking the lab buildings, he approached a series of presentation boards. We set about isolating the conscious mind and building responsive capsules to contain it. The first shells we built looked human, a mixture of synthetic structures covered by organic tissue designed to enhance the senses and experiences we already have. He looked to Elizabeth, who nodded regally and said, Sight, taste, touch and so on. He continued. Yes, however, early testing proved uh, problematic. The consciousness always rejected the host body. Like um, forcing a cat into box when it's time for vet, you know? He looked at Elizabeth for validation, who certainly did not know. Turning back to the boards, Leopold surveyed the images of early failures with a concerned eye. He explained, One day, however, inspiration struck. Whilst observing the growth of various crustaceans, I thought, perhaps the minds themselves should guide the designs of the new bodies. See, I theorised that if we allowed each brain to manifest its own shell, then the consciousness would regard it more as a native limb than a foreign body. He peered up at Elizabeth again through her glass container to check that she was following. Sharp as a needle, Elizabeth nodded along. So you adapted the programme. People designed their own shells. User generated. Yes, ma'am. 3D printers were equipped with high-tech materials, metals, plastic, ceramics, electronics, and other thingamabobs, and we allowed the mind to guide the process by stimulating parts of the brain and picking up on the response signals. These feedback routines help form the artificial components of the new body. At that point, the mind enters the new shell, and then we need to foster the growth of the organic tissues from the human participant. So we seal the shells into an incubator egg filled with stem cell plasma. Dr. Buttercake rotated one of the display boards to reveal another host of diagrams. The rest of the shells grow there, sometimes in days, sometimes weeks. It uses stem cell tissue from the participant, but also a whole range of other animal, insect and plant matter. Fascinating! exclaimed Elizabeth, 
to the relief of Leopold, who was looking as though he'd scaled the walls of Buckingham Palace without a safety net. He continued, The initial results were astounding, ma'am. New kinds of body, wilder than anyone could have imagined. And also quite splendid, if I do say so myself. Leopold pulled at a velvet rope dangling above his head, which dropped a curtain behind Elizabeth. A window looked into a grassy enclosure. I say exclaimed Elizabeth as she gained upon a marvellous creature, slithering about on multiple tentacles. It appeared to have a dozen eyes, several horns, and a body shimmering in the light with innumerable polypropylene wings. Her scarfers gasped and reached for their mobile devices to take pictures before remembering they had all been confiscated. The underside of the beast's torso looked suspiciously like the manufactured plate of a household iron including screws and fastenings, which clanked and scraped the glass as the creature moved longingly towards Leopold. Say hello to Barbara Smith, or Barb S08, ma'am. The humour is still in there, she just needs a little encouragement. They tend to get quite attached at first. Leopold raised his podgy hand and gestured for the security guard to lower the gates of the enclosure, which hissed open into the wider courtyard. Go now, be free said Leopold gently, and Barb SO8's many eyes appeared to register the command and turn away. They always listen, but they usually cannot speak. Not in human languages, anyway. Leopold lifted a small circuit board and played with its wires and valves. We've been trialling these implants for humans, you know, to communicate with the pearls. Perhaps even to heal our human bodies. He clicked about with it, and with a look of frustration, tapped it harshly on the table. Eh, nothing conclusive yet, though. This creature was formed from the participant's own mind, said Elizabeth, aghast. Yes, ma'am, and quite content the little blighter is, too. Some of our researchers believe these shells answer unmentioned longings, you know, unfulfilled needs. They are often more beast, object, or plant than human, without the eyes, ears, noses, mouths, and skin we are accustomed to. Many shells incorporate domestic or architectural features. A chair, a pair of shoes, a door jam, a stone buttress or an ornamental frieze. Although we can't be sure why. Anyway, no two are alike, ma'am. All shells are unique. But say one was to transform into one of these creatures, would one remain oneself? What I mean to say is, are they conscious? Elizabeth delved. Yes, ma'am, I see why you ask. You wonder whether these entities can still be people. We're gathering masses of data on the psychology and neurology behind the process of shell creation. What we know for sure is that the pearls retain all their human memories, they have all their feelings and emotional responses to stimuli, but we think their priorities aren't really directed towards the human world. They want to grow and bloom like plants, bathe and play like otters, crystallize and form like minerals. It's as though their focus has shifted from human life to life itself. Life with a capital L, ma'am. Perhaps they are like the spirit of human, animal, plant and mineral combined. Slightly overcome, Leopold's throat tightened and he stalled by cleaning his spectacles with a cotton handkerchief. He continued, The board of Shell Court said we have a PR problem on account of the optics. They told me, No one wants to be a mutant, Dr. Buttercake. But I don't think they see it right, ma'am. Life has become too tough for the lonely old folk and for the little ones breathing in the fumes from the moment they're born. We can offer them a new world. We can take back control. They left the conference room and toured a series of enclosures in which Elizabeth was shown the weird and wonderful forms the trial subjects had made of themselves. It was a kind of alien safari of former humans, most of whom were terminal patients or very elderly. Elizabeth was often reminded of curious deep-sea creatures with soft, gentle forms floating or bobbing or pulsating, prehensile tentacles, pouches of glowing bacteria, transparent skin with softly beating clockwork hearts. Leopold had feared Elizabeth might regard them as monstrosities, but she surprised him. From the confines of her floating throne, she looked on their mech-organic forms and saw a kind of freedom that reminded her of the shining yellow petals of her beloved primroses. She could not always tell where one body ended and the next body began, She waved to each of the creatures, although she didn't know if they even noticed her. Harmony, she said, struggling to adjust herself on the throne mobile, now glitching up and down on the edge of a security barrier as a staffer steadied it. 
There were some shells which appeared to be working industriously, but for quite impractical pursuits, such as one half-oil derrick half-bindweed form which continually planted itself and dug itself back up. Some shells glimmered like gold and anchored themselves to the bottom of diving pools like hidden jewels. Some were light and papery and blew around freely in the wind, and some microshells had nestled themselves inside seed pods to wait for spring. Elizabeth could believe the idea that in some way, these former people were healing themselves from traumas suffered in their past lives. Now they simply existed to exist. Quite exquisite, she sighed. I should like to be a horse. Having left the Queen with Dr. Mary Markowitz so he could sneak off for a cigarette, Leopold was pouring a cup of tea in the break room when Elizabeth tapped on the window with a scepter extension arm of her throne mobile. You there, Dr. Buttercake. He hurried out to Elizabeth, rubbing his hands with a cotton handkerchief. All must regard themselves as a pearl, you see, she said. No matter what curious affectation one's body may display, one must always have respect for the sovereignty of one's own mind. Dr. Buttercake nodded thoughtfully and said, Your Majesty, we have referred to these new structures as shells, but as you say, the beings themselves are indeed pearls within those shells. You're quite right. And so the new beings were named pearls in Elizabeth's honour, while their bodies continued to be called shells. Elizabeth continued, We must manufacture shells for all our subjects, to be free of the woes which beset us. She thought once more about the Korean tale of the old woman who got a second chance, and called to her chief of staff, Edward Snippet. Edward, if something should happen to my physical body, something life-threatening or debilitating, bring me here and set me free. Write that down now. Edward Snippet, who much to his own frustration was still clinging to a piece of rolled up red carpet, was a pointy and bookish figure. Feathery wisps of hair covered his skull-shaped scalp, and everything he said sounded like a complaint. Upon interviewing him for the role, Elizabeth observed his temperament and imagined he would be the perfectly disagreeable gatekeeper she needed to keep the press away. She continued, Yes, I'm quite sure of it. One day I wish to become a pearl. Dedicate more resources to this program. Land, money and staff. Whatever Dr. Buttercake needs. Perhaps, Leopold, you would be willing to relocate? Soon after her visit, an area of land was cleared in and around the estate of Balmoral Castle in Scotland. The boundaries were secured by the military, and the area was renamed the Garden of Shells. Participants in the Shell program were released into this garden like majestic beasts into the wild. One day, Elizabeth intended to join them. The ancient corridors of Westminster buzzed with gossip about the program. One enthusiastic advocate was former Prime Minister Boris Johnson, who began to lobby for the Shell Act a package of measures to incentivize people to transform and to ensure safety for anyone who did. Yeah, Britain will, once again, be regarded as the garden of the world, a glorious garden to rival that of the fabled Eden, Boris exhorted his peers as they voted the legislation through. Within the legal mumbo-jumbo of the act, there were three essential tenets. Pearls would never be harmed. Pearls would never be incarcerated. Pearls would never be exploited for human gain. It was later sold to the public as a kind of afterlife or bonus round, and a donor lottery gave the terminally ill the opportunity to transform whether they could afford to pay or not. Thus, there was a steady supply of low-profile subjects to help develop the technology by undergoing shell transfer. Not all transformations were a success. The Shell Corp board had to work hard to ensure that no one outside the Garden of Shells was privy to the failures the anomalies, as they were named. Horrific forms were conjured by the minds of those who had been overexposed to the toxins and traumas of the failing old world, and these sought to attack any human or shell which came near. Such anomalies were locked up underground, where a team of researchers tried to coax the minds out of these tortured bodies and into other, less dangerous shells, but without success. Some were kept alive because of who they had been related to, some were useful research subjects, Others were kept alive because it was not clear how they might be terminated. Incineration, freezing, poison. On occasion these methods worked, but many times the anomalies proved invulnerable. Shells seemed particularly adapted to hostile environments and corrosive or destructive weapons. Like the byproducts of nuclear fission, the failures of the shell creation procedure were almost impossible to dispose of, and over time these living beings accumulated, stored in the miserable facility beneath Balmoral. 
unable to live and unable to die. After much research and testing with the initial wave of donors, physiological and psychological tests were developed to screen participants, to flag any discrepancies in the processes of consciousness and limit the frequency of these anomalies. This all but abated the issue, and the secret was largely kept. Some of us slipped through the net. An anomaly seeks not peace, nor a contented existence. Upon my forehead the name of mischief, and mischief I would wreak. One year after her tour of Shell Labs, Elizabeth's time had come. She was going to free the pearl inside. She lay strapped to a metal gurney in a room filled with sinister robotic equipment. Despite the failure of her body, Elizabeth's heartbeat was strong. She gazed at Leopold, who beamed back and took her frail hand. Edward Snippet saw this as quite the imposition and tapped his foot loudly on the floor, gesturing for Leopold to pay attention to his work. The equipment was prepared by Dr. Buttercake himself. Elizabeth's gaunt face peered through the plastic confines of her hazmat suit like a powdered ghost at a window. Some LEDs on the control bank went green, and a low-key buzzing signalled that the primary operating machines were powered up. She felt an inner warmth, and Elizabeth's worldly eyes closed for one final time. <laughs>